Hey there, I'm Sarah A. Chrisman, the author of The Tales of Chetsamoka and many other books about the Victorian era, including Victorian Secrets, what of course it taught me about the past, the present, and myself. And today I'm going to talk to you about corsets. Now I should point out that I've written a book about corsets, an entire nonfiction book called Victorian Secrets, What a Corset Taught Me About the Past, the Present, and Myself. And if you have any questions after you've watched this video, you should read the book because chances are very, very good that the answers to whatever questions might, you might have are going to be in that book. Yes. Cats love corset laces. I don't know if you can see that they're trying to catch them. But girls, if you would let me get dressed, I would appreciate it. <laughs> they do this every morning. Um, I've been wearing corsets on a daily basis for 14 years. So I do, when I've been studying them for a lot longer than that. So I do feel like I'm qualified to talk about them. Now, Hollywood and its online equivalents make a lot of money by putting really weird ideas into people's heads. Um, but money-making melodramas are really not the best way to help people understand things. They're not really the best way to help people understand history or how to help out other people. Bastet, would you please let go of my laces? Thank you. <laughs> um, and Diana. If you girls would just let me get dressed, I would dearly appreciate it. Okay. Anyhow, um, so, like I said, Hollywood is really not the best way to help people understand things. Um, thank you. <laughs> and I like helping people understand things. So, something I... Well, aside from the cats, <laughs> something I'd like to point out to you is that as I was getting myself laced up, I was not groaning, panting, or making any of the other vaguely sexual noises you'll hear actresses making on screen when they're laced up in a film, and nor was I grasping a bedpost or groping any other large phallic object. Filmmakers love to do that sort of thing uh, because it sticks in people's minds. Makes people take notice because, as the saying goes, sex sells. So, therefore makes the filmmakers and actors more money. But, like I said, it's not a great way to help people understand things. And also, the more melodramatic filmmakers and actors can make something, the more money they make. So an actress who screams and complains about wearing a corset for a role she was playing is going to get a lot more attention and a lot more press and therefore a lot more money than an actress who just says, yeah, I wore a corset for that role. It was great. I liked it. Now, <laughs> what I want you to remember and take away from this more than anything is that people in the past were not actors playing roles. History is not just a big sound stage where people were playing dress up. It was a real world and people were living real lives. And I'm 
going to, after this is all done, I'm going to show you some pictures of ladies from the 19th century. And something I'd like you to pay attention to in any photograph you'll ever see of the Victorian era is that the women are almost always wearing corsets. And it was just part of being dressed in the 19th century, just like modern women consider wearing a bra part of being dressed. And incidentally, as a woman, I, in the 14 years of corset wearing, I've been doing so far, I find corsets a lot more comfortable than any sort of bra that the 20th or 21st century has come up with. Uh, because bras put a lot of tension on the shoulder girdle. They try to, try to haul breasts up from below. Whereas a corset supports, or sorry, bras try to haul breasts up from above. Whereas a corset supports breasts from below. Which distributes the weight a lot better. And the fact that corsets support the back is just an added bonus. Now, I've got a couple of antique 19th century corsets here that I wanted to show you. Kitties, you did not get to attack these. Now, this one is, it was a museum deaccession, so it's quite lovely. It's in, pre, it's in rather pristine condition. Whereas this one is very worn. <laughs> it was mended a lot. And you can see all of the tattered places. But something I'd like to point out to you, first of all, some corset anatomy. The whole corset is called a corset, of course. It's also called a set of stays or a body. Now, up front, there is a metal busk, and in the back there are laces. This is what cats were attacking. They're like shoelaces, but longer. And Diana, don't get any ideas. <laughs> now, the busk, oh, you can't see it very well on this black one. Um, here, I've got a, I think you might be able to see it. Yeah, you can see it a little better in this newer one. Okay, so this is one of my reproductions that I wear. You can see things better. Uh, these metal clasps are part of what's called a busk that goes down the front. And this is what comes apart. Now these clasps are held together by tension on the laces in the back. If you untie the laces, then you lose the tension on the clasps and the corset basically comes undone. If you try to undo the clasps without undoing the laces, then you risk bending or breaking these, because these, I mean, they're sturdy, but they're not indestructible. And they're designed to have tension in one direction only. They're not designed to bend or wiggle around, and so they can, they can break. Now, the other most important part of corset anatomy can see these bits sticking out. Let's go all along the corset, up and down. These are bones. They're also called stays, but they're usually called bones or ribs. They're called that because they were made out of whalebone for a while. And whalebone, it hangs from the upper upper jaw of a lot of the big whales, they use it to strain krill. But it's made out of the same material as our fingernails, it's keratin. And if you've ever broken a nail, don't scratch that. Ooh. Don't scratch that. Here. You can be cute for the camera, not scratching the furniture. Ooh. Anyhow, Bastet was just trying to demonstrate the, the nails. <laughs> Anyhow, if you're a human and you've ever broken a nail, you know they're fragile, they break. And the little slivers of whalebone that people used to put in corsets, those can break too. And when that happens, you have a broken bone. 
I like to point out to people this is a millinery emergency, not a medical one. Because those are also called ribs. You can also call it a broken rib. People get a lot of mileage out of that. So this is what a one of those little bones looks like outside of a corset. This one is made out of spring steel. It's basically the same steel that they make hair barrettes out of, which was a common material after they stopped using whalebone. A lot of modern corsets use a version of these made out of a type of plastic, which can be kind of brittle when it gets old, just like the old whalebone. So the plastic ones can break too, just like the whalebone whalebone ones did. But again, this was a millinery emergency, not a medical one. Corsets accentuate, and by so doing, celebrate the distinctly feminine features that set women apart from men. As the French say, vive la différence. An attack on the corset is essentially an attack on femininity. But in my opinion, it's when we're feeling our most feminine that women are most empowered. Thank you for watching today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, if you have any questions about corsets, you should read my book, Victorian Secrets, because it'll probably answer any questions. And be sure to tell your friends about it, too. Happy reading!